This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The name Christian is a beautiful name. It appears three times in the New Testament. We read where the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch in Acts 11 and 26. And then Agrippa says in Acts 26, 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then Peter writes, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God uh, in this name or on this behalf. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. The etymology of the name Christian is extremely expressive. It is composed of the name Christ and the suffix I-A-N. The suffix simply means belonging to. So that then a Christian or a Christian is one who belongs to Christ. Now, keeping that in mind, we turn to the first Corinthian letter, chapter 1, and beginning with verse 10 and going down through verse 13, Paul addresses a divisive state in the church in Corinth. They were so divided that they were saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Now, to correct that divisive state, Paul asks a series of questions. And among them he asks, was Paul crucified for you? And secondly, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Please remember those two questions. Now, the statement, I am of, means I belong to. In fact, Moffat's translation renders the text thusly. Hence, they were saying, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, and some were saying, I belong to Christ. But now Paul says, you cannot say, I am a Paul, that is, I belong to Paul, unless first, was Paul crucified for you? And secondly, were you baptized in his name? Now, what was true of Paul was also true of Apollos and of Cephas and, uh, of course, of Paul himself. But then what was true of these three was also true of Christ, so that they could not say, I am of Christ, that is, I belong to Christ, but that's the definition of being a Christian, one who belongs to Christ. But they could not thus say, unless what? Unless one, Christ had been crucified for them, and secondly, unless they had been baptized in his name. Now, what was true of the Corinthians is true for you and me today, so that none of us can say that we are of Christ, that is, we belong to Christ, that is, we are Christians, unless our Lord was crucified for us, and unless we have been baptized in his name. Now, certainly, we can check off requisite number one. He has been crucified for us. But secondly, have we ever been baptized in his name? That's a question of tremendous import. But right now, may I just simply observe that, again, for emphasis sake, here you have Christ being crucified, and over here you have a person being baptized. Now momentarily, again, we will come back to that particular observation. In the Ephesian letter chapter 2, and in verses 8 through 10, Paul declared, For by grace are ye saved through faith. That particular passage is extremely comprehensive. It teaches us, first of all, that there are two sides to salvation. There is a divine side, and there is a human side. Secondly, on the divine side, naturally, there is God, and on the human side, again, there is man. Now, over here on the divine side, God's side of salvation, the text teaches us that there is a principle of operation, and that principle of operation is grace. But then over here on the human side of salvation, man's side, there is also a principle of operation. And that principle of operation is faith. Hence it is by grace through faith. But now notice as we continue the development. 
Over here on the divine side, God's side, you have the principle of grace. But now grace became operative. It was not inanimate nor non-expressive, but again, it was operative. Now, what about God's grace becoming operative? In John 1 and 17, we read, the law came by Moses, but grace, there it is, but grace came by Jesus Christ. So whenever our Lord left heaven and came to this earth and lived among men and ultimately was crucified, all of that was a demonstration of the grace of God. But additionally, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and in verses 28 through 30, the Hebrew writer speaks of the spirit of grace. Of how much so are punishment, suppose ye he reasons, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of Man, hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and an holy thing, and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Now, why would the Holy Spirit be called the spirit of grace? simply because everything he did in effecting the scheme of redemption is rooted in and is a demonstration of the grace of God. Now, in the scheme of redemption, his work primarily was twofold. It was revelatory, and it also was confirmatory. Now, if I were to have a, a sheet of paper and write thereon the following equation, what would be thus involved? Suppose I were to put an R, and then put a plus sign, and then put the initial I, and then the equal sign, and then have a B. The equation would be read as follows. Revelation plus inspiration equals Bible. So the Bible is the results of what? It's the results of revelation plus inspiration. Now, revelation has to do with the impartation of information that could not be known otherwise than supernaturally. For example, whenever Moses penned Genesis 1, 1 and thus penned, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he know that? He was not back there. The only way he knew that was by revelation. Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He revealed that information unto Moses. Revelation, it's the impartation of information that could not be known otherwise than supernaturally. But then... In our equation, there is that second initial, and that's the initial I, standing for inspiration. Now, inspiration has to do with two things, the accurate reception of the revelation, and then the accurate transmission thereof. So in addition to the Holy Spirit revealing to the New Testament apostles and prophets, the mind of God, he continued his work, in the area of inspiration. And in so doing, he saw that these accurately received the revelation. Now, have you ever told somebody something and they did not get it straight? Well, all of us have had that experience. But in the material with which we're presently dealing, the Holy Spirit not only revealed the mind of God, but he saw that the recipients accurately received it. But then, in addition, he then saw that they accurately transmitted it. Sometimes they transmitted it verbally, orally, and sometimes they put it in written form. But whether it was delivered verbally or in written form, the Holy Spirit, in the process of inspiration, saw that what had been revealed was accurately transmitted. And that's why we read of plenary and verbal inspiration of the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So then, in our equation, we have Bible. But the Bible results from revelation and inspiration. So that the Bible comes to be because the Holy Spirit revealed the omniscient mind of Almighty God, and then he saw that the information was accurately received, and then when it was put into a written form, it was accurately transmitted. So that today, whenever I opened my Bible and I began to read the sacred content therein, I am reading the revelation of the omniscient mind of Almighty God. 
mighty God. And that's why whenever our Bibles are read, as it were, we ought to take off our shoes because we are standing on holy ground. Campbell was right when he said, any time I open my Bible to read it, I do so as if it had just fallen from the hand of God, and he wasn't far from wrong. But now, what about that word? In the book of Acts 20 and 32, Paul told the Ephesian elders, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Now, that's our present study, God's grace. But we're observing that God's grace became operative. And in the operation of his grace, we have the coming of Christ and his ultimate crucifixion, the work of the Holy Spirit resulting in the Word. And as you know, in addition to that that we have just uh, uh, spoken concerning, then the Holy Spirit also enabled the apostles and the early disciples to perform miracles to confirm or to verify that the Word indeed was uh, the Word of God. So then you have His work then being confirmatory and revelatory. Now then, by way of just a brief review, over here we have the uh, divine side of salvation, God's side of salvation, and the principle of operation grace. But that principle of operation becoming operative, and it became operative in that our Lord came to this earth and ultimately was crucified. But now over on the other side, what do we have? We have the human side of salvation, man's side of salvation, and the principle of operation is faith. But just as in the case of grace, so with faith. Faith must become operative. That's why then Romans 1, 5, and 6 speaks of the obedience to the faith. That's why Romans 16, 26 speaks of the obedience of faith. And why Galatians 5 and 6 says, the faith that avails is the faith that works by love. Here is faith becoming operative. And that is so beautifully illustrated in the book of Acts chapter 8 wherein we read the conversion of the Samaritans. And in verse 12 we read, And when they, that is the Samaritans, and when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized. Now then, that text begins by saying, when they believe. Then you have the two-point outline of Philip's sermon, the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. And then you have the text uh, concluding with, and they were baptized. If you will omit the two-point outline in the text, the flow of the text is maintained. And thus it would read, when they believed, they were baptized. Now, why does the Bible read like that? Simply because any time a man truly believes, he will be baptized, and if he is baptized scripturally, it is because he is a true believer. But the point is that faith has become operative in our becoming baptized. Now then, do you remember a moment ago where we observed that the name Christian means belonging to and how no one can say, I belong to Christ unless one, Christ has been crucified for him, and two, unless he has been baptized in the name of the Lord. So what's the point? Friends, if we want a Bible answer to who is a Christian, we would simply say that a Christian is a sinner who has been saved by grace because the Lord was crucified through faith because he has been baptized. And that's how beautifully simple the Bible is. Now, whenever I thus obeyed the gospel and became a Christian, whenever you thus obeyed the Lord and became a Christian, you brought joy to heaven. Luke 15, 10 says, There is more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. And in addition to that, not only in our obedience did we bring joy to heaven, but then heaven sent joy to indwell our hearts. That's why when the Ethiopian was baptized in Acts 8, 26 through 40, the text says he went on his way how? Rejoicing. 
Don't you recall whenever the jailer was baptized in Acts 16, 30 through 35? The text says he brought them into his house after thus being baptized and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. And thus we read in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. So what is the point? Simply this. That becoming a Christian and living the Christian life is a life of joy and a life of happiness. And so today, as we continue our study, I would like in a very brief fashion to uh, peruse the question, why I am happy to be a Christian. Out of the many reasons that could thus be listed, I only want to mention three. In the first place, I am happy to be a Christian because it makes life worth living. Don't you recall in John 10, 10 where Christ said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. Yes, indeed. He came to bring us the abundant life. And then Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable in all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In fact, that text is somewhat reminiscent of the 23rd Psalm. Let's suppose today that I were to ask you to take a piece of paper. And then I were to say, friends, whenever I mention a given chapter in the Bible, would you mind writing on that slip of paper what comes into your mind just first of all? What will you have written? Now here is the chapter, Psalms 23. Now what did you write? Well, most of us wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, or, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's an indeed commendable. But why did not any of us write the last statement of the psalm? It looks like we remember that about as quickly as we would the first statement of the psalm. But what is that last statement? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes, my friends, serving God does pertain to the house of the Lord forever, but it also pertains to all the days of my life. And the Lord says that I can be the recipient of his goodness and of his mercy during that time. So why am I a Christian? Because it makes life worth living. I would have you to obey the gospel this very day. This very day. Why? Yes, because you may die before midnight. But add to that, I would have you to obey the gospel today because you may live tomorrow. And Christianity makes life worth living. I recall when but a child growing up, that Brother G.A. Don used to come to the home church and hold meetings, and Brother Basil Doran would lead the singing. And Brother Don would oftentimes get up in the pulpit and he would say, Brother Doran, let's sing. And it was his favorite song. And what do you think it was? Ah, yes, I can recall how we would sing and we would uh, sing so beautifully these lyrics. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And how true and how beautiful are those words. But friends, I am so grateful today that in, in addition to preaching concerning the sweet by and by, I can also preach to you about the sweet now and now. That's one reason why I am happy to be a Christian. But secondly, I am happy to be a Christian because it means that I can pray and that with confidence. Do we not read in 1 Peter 3 and 12, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them to do evil. And then what about Matthew 7 beginning with 7? Ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. And then what about John chapter 15, 6 and 7, where the Lord said, Abide in me, and my word abide in you. And if such be the case, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You see, that is a conditional phrase. Abide in me, 
and let my word abide in you. And ye, that's a restrictive ye, ye whom? Ye abiding in me ones, ye letting my word abide in you ones. These are the ye ones to whom the promise is made. You can ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Friends, if I had my preaching life to begin anew, there would not be many changes I would make, but there would be one that I have made many years now uh, prior, in prior times, but I would make it from the very beginning, and here it is. I would preach more on the fatherhood of God. We must come to understand and deeply believe in the fatherhood of God. And where is the father that does not listen to his children and desire to give them their request? We have three sons. And if any one of those three sons were to call today and say, Daddy, I need, and if that need was legitimate, I would do everything within my power to see that that request was granted. And so it is when we prostrate ourselves in, on our closet floors and we say, Father, and we pour out our hearts unto him, letting him know the deepest needs of our heart and lives. Surely such an one as our Father hears and is so desirous of giving. Hence did not our Lord say, Which of you will have a son that will ask for a fish and he will give him, you know, a serpent? Or he'll ask for a piece of bread and you'll give him a stone. Well, no father would react like that. And then he concludes, If ye being evil, that is evil in comparison to Jehovah, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father give good things unto those who ask him? And so I am so happy to be a Christian today because it means that I can pray and I can pray with assurance. How many times in life have we been faced with great challenges? How many times have our hearts been apprehensive? How many times have we, for example, been given news that is not pleasant? How many times have we may even personally tread the valley of the shadow of death? How many times have we stood by the bedside of a dear loved one in which life and death are struggling for supremacy? How many times have we stood by the caskets of those uh, found therein who were the nearest and dearest to us on earth? How many times have we had the challenges of rearing children through the turbulent teenage periods? How many times have tribulations laid us low? How many times have burdens indeed uh, brought our backs nearly to where we were bent double? How many times and where would we have been during these times if we could not have gone to God and said, My Father, and ask for help, and to say, Father, please hear me, and Father, bless me, sustain me, and guide me. And so as we oftentimes say and sing, Where could I go? but to the Lord. And the answer to that question is, there is no other source, no other place to which we could go so many times in life. I remember the story that came out of the life of the late great uh, gospel preacher, Brother Gus Nichols. A man came to him one day and said, Brother Nichols, I don't think God hears me anymore when I pray. And in his own inimitable way, Brother Nichols said, I'll tell you what I would like for you to do. I would like for you to select a night when it is so black that you can just cut it with a knife. The stars are not shining. The moon is not out. And at midnight, I want you to go out into the woods. And out there where nobody can see you and nobody can hear you, and under those circumstances, I want you to double up your fist. And I want you to shake it in the face of God and say, I dare you to strike me dead. Oh, the man was taken back. He couldn't believe he was hearing that. And Brother Nicholas said, won't you do that? And he said, why no, a thousand times no. And then Brother Nicholas said, well, why? And he said, why, well, I'm afraid God might do it. He said, now there you are. You think that God will hear you when you blaspheme, but you doubt that God hears you when you pray. My friends, that's powerful. 
If we're not careful, we'll think God hears us when we use His name in vain out on the job. But we doubt that He will hear us when we're in our closets. So perhaps we need to pray more than we really do. Lord, increase our faith. Let us pray. For prayer is not conquering God's reluctance, but rather laying hold on God's willingness. Yes, indeed then, let us pray. But thirdly today, why am I happy to be a Christian? I am happy to be a Christian because it means that I can face death with assurance. And face death I will. Job said in Job 5, 26, Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn cometh in its season. Notice that certainty, thou shalt come to thy grave. Paul would say, as an Adam all die, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. The Hebrew writer says, it's appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9 and 27. Solomon said, there's a time to be born and a time to die, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 2. And so die, yes, indeed we will. I remember returning to a place where I had formerly done local work, uh, for a series of meetings. But to go back to the time when I was doing local work there, I had been out into the rural areas to preach a funeral. I came back through what we would call North Town to visit one of our members that was delinquent. Or he'd come two services and miss a half a dozen, come back and maybe attend one or two and miss another three or four. And so he was very spasmodic and irregular and certainly not committed to the Lord and to his cause. So I decided I'd go back by and I would visit him and talk to him about his soul. And I said to him, I said, Cecil, do you know where I've been? Well, he said, don't have any idea. He said, where have you been? And I said, I've been out and gave the cemetery's location. I said, we've just buried and gave the man's name. Oh, he said, I didn't even know you died. I said, yes, and just finished preaching his funeral. And then I turned to Cecil, who was this delinquent member, and I said, Cecil, have you ever taken to heart that one of these days we're going to be taking you out of this town and burying you in a grave six feet deep and three feet wide? I said, have you ever taken that to heart? Oh, just... And changed the topic. In two Sundays, he was restored to duty. Well, in the meeting and, uh, to which I had gone uh, to hold sometime after leaving that local program, he was there. Been faithful all during the intervening time. And he walked out the door one night in the meeting. He said, Brother Winkler, he said, do you remember when you lived here among us and you came to see me when I wasn't faithful? I said, yes. He said, do you remember what you told me? I said, yes, I do. He said, as strange as it may sound to you, up until what you told me, it had never dawned on me I was going to die. But when I got a hold of that, I straightened up in a hurry. It'll happen every time. You know, what, you know what our problem is? In this tinfoil age in which we live, in these butterflies times of our existence, we don't think much about death and dying. But ladies and gentlemen, you are going to die. And I'm so happy to be a Christian because it means I can face death with assurance. Now, the reasons why that is the case, well, these reasons are multiple. But may I just mention these? First, a Christian can face death with assurance because he will have made sufficient preparation. It reminds us of Paul in Acts 21 and 13 when he said, What mean you to weep and to break mine heart? He said, I am not only ready to be bound in Jerusalem, he says, I am ready to die. And Paul could say, I'm ready to die for three reasons. First, he had formed the proper relationship with Christ. Did he not say in Romans 6 and 3, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? So what about Paul's relationship? He was in Christ, and that by virtue of the fact that he had been baptized. But secondly, he could say, I'm ready to die because he had divorced himself from the world. He said, I am crucified to the world, Galatians 2 and 20. And thirdly, because he had faithfully served Christ. 
to where he could say to the young preacher in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith, and I have finished the course. And none of us can say, I am ready to die unless we are in Christ, have divorced ourselves from the world, and we're faithfully serving. Now, that's why a Christian can face death with assurance, because he has made himself ready. But secondly, he can say that I can face death with assurance because he knows it's better over there. Did not Paul say, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through uh, 24. And so, it's far better over there. But then thirdly, the Christian can face death with assurance because he knows he will never cross Jordan alone. It reminds me of Acts chapter 7. Whenever we read of the passing from time into the other world in the life of Stephen, and as Stephen was dying, he looked up into heaven, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, as it were doing what? Witnessing his passing from time side to the other. You see, a child of God never has to cross Jordan alone. That's why the psalmist said in Psalms 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they do comfort me. Several years ago, I was in a series of meetings in Dunlap, Tennessee, in the Sequatchie Valley. I related the story I'm about to relate and the brethren said, Brother Winkler, we wish the weather was not so inclement. Said, we'd like to take you out to where that happened. I did not even realize what I had related had taken place in that community. Well, I went back several years after that, and I made reference to the fact that that incident had occurred in this community. And uh, the weather was not inclement. And the brother said, Brother Winkler, said on the way back to the services tonight, we'll take you to where it happened. And now here is the story. I related this in Paragool, Arkansas, many years ago. An elderly lady in excess of 90 walked out the building and said, Brother Winkler, I heard him tell that story in a meeting here when I was just a teenage girl, during which time I obeyed the gospel. So I know the story has to be accurate. But add to that, I have a copy of the a funeral sermon preached at his funeral by Brother J.C. McQuitty that was published in the Gospel Advocate in which Brother McQuitty told the same story out of his life. But now to whom do I make reference? I now make reference to Brother T.B. Larimore. When Brother Larimore was a young boy, he took a job in a store that served the rural area wherein he lived. He knew he'd have to work until dark, and he knew that he'd have to make his way back home through darkness. And he also knew that between the store where he worked and his home was a ravine. And he had grown up hearing how wild beasts hid in that ravine, how robbers hid in that ravine. And he knew he'd have to cross that ravine. And Brother Larimore said all during the day he thought about that crossing. And he said he became so fearful. And he said his, his heart would scarcely stay within his bosom. But finally, the store closed. Night had come. And now he's making his way toward home. And he said when he was approaching the ravine's edge, again his heart would scarcely stay in his bosom. But he looked. And across the ravine, there was the flicker of a lantern and you heard a voice, and it said, T.B., is that you? Don't be afraid. Come on across. This is mother. And then Brother Larimore said, all the fear that had gripped his heart was dissipated 
and with full confidence he crossed over. I would like to think it's going to be something like that for me. That whenever I come to cross as we sing the chilly waters of Jordan, I will not have to cross it alone. But as it were on the other side, there will be my Savior. And as I began to make my journey across the turbulent sea, it is then that he reaches out his hand and he safely leads me across to the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, you can take the world. It don't have much luster to me anymore. But what I have just told you is what I want. And that's another reason why I am happy to be a Christian. Who is a Christian? He's simply a sinner saved by grace because of the crucifixion. Through faith, because his faith has led him to be baptized as a penitent. And whenever we thus became a Christian, we did bring joy to heaven. Ah, yes, but how much joy was sent from heaven to indwell our hearts. And today we can be happy as Christians because it makes life worth living. Because we can pray with confidence. And thirdly, we can face death with assurance. If you're listening today and you are a Christian, surely with me you can rejoice because you are such an one. And if you're not, may we with every fiber of our being encourage you to become that sinner, saved by grace through faith, by becoming a baptized, penitent believer, letting God's grace save you through the merits of His own Son's blood. May heaven help you to this end. Thank you very much. This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory.